there can be a strange beauty in destruction. An unwanted attraction that draws you into the billowing violence in and out of the dark. On July 16, 1945, at about 5.30 in the morning, a nuclear device was exploded in the New Mexico desert, beginning the Atomic Age. In October 2004, federal authorities discovered a man living in a cave on the territory of the Los Alamos National Lab, the birthplace of nuclear weapons. He had been living there undetected for several years. His cave featured a camouflage door, a stove, shelving, a variety of stored equipment, and had electricity supplied by solar panels. The man living in the cave also had a sizable rock that he found 20 years earlier that he strongly believed to be a meteorite from Mars. He also had a well-developed theory of time and space, called gravionics, that claimed to improve upon Einstein's understanding of the world, and was going to transform modern science. This is the story of that caveman. He calls himself Micro Mike. And they call me Micro Mike. I originally had it because of microcomputers, and I was very good in microcomputers, so I took the name Micro Mike, but then when I switched to philosophy, I decided to keep it since micro meant the millionth of the very small. And I just wanted to remain humble in my thoughts. Realize that my place in the cosmos is very small. Not think I'm more important than I am. It was one of those very, very clear dark nights in Amarillo, Texas. And we lived right on the edge of the city and there were no street lights yet in those days. So it, we had a perfect view of the night sky and it was perfectly clear and crisp and and all the stars were showing in the entire Milky Way and there were so many stars it looked like you could just reach up and grab a handful of them. I asked my mom, I says, how far do they go? And she says, oh, they go on forever. And so that really stuck with me how important stars were. But the other part of it is sometime around the same time my mother set me down and she told me two things. She says, son, you're a Christian, and this is what Christians do. So they read their Bible every night, and they pray to God for those things that are important and those things that they want. And as a child, I really didn't know what was important. So I just prayed each night, God, let me do something important. But every night, I prayed for a piece of space. I wanted a piece of star is what I wanted. When I first realized that my meteorite was probably a piece of a planet, the planet Mars, I was a little disappointed because my really my childhood prayer had been, God send me a piece of a star. It's what I'd want, but I'd always said a piece of space in my prayers. So he was technically correct in sending me a piece of Mars, I think. If it's ever recognized for what it is, it's going to be the most valuable rock on the planet. And so I guess everybody will want it or want to steal it. NASA's planning on spending at least a billion dollars to go to Mars and get a pound of Martian material. If they would look at this, it appears to be almost a very perfect sample. If, we, if the scientists could just write out a list of what they would like to find on a sample to, from Mars, this appears to have it including small little plant material and the remains of insect bodies and then possibly even one species that's still alive today. When I was a little boy, science was really the first thing that interested me. That's exactly what I wanted. It was stuck to a bunch of rocks. And to me it really meant the joy of discovering something new the curiosity of really caring about and understanding how nature worked. And it seems to me that a lot of the scientists in the world have totally lost that, that love and that curiosity. I present them with a meteorite that I tell them apparently has the life of another planet on it. And I've been rejected by every meteoritic person, every exobiology person. I even went to the 
head of NASA contamination control, whose job is to make sure we don't contaminate one planet with another. And I said, look, I've got a meteorite here that appears to be contaminating the Earth. Don't you think you should, you know, study it and understand it? As I looked at a meteorite, I saw these insect bodies all the time. And so for a long time, I wondered, well, what, what, what ate the insects? You know, what was the hunter of the insects? And then I realized these filaments may act as living spider webs. They're sticking up. You see how they're sticking up from a rock? If an insect came along, he would get trapped in there. And then they would just attach to him, take out whatever they need, I guess, and go on. So over time, they may have learned to actually harvest their insects and grow them. And that may be what they're doing in people, is they're actually growing their food supply and the person's just a gut, is providing the water. He said, don't ever write me again. I'll decide what I study. I'll decide what's contaminated, not you. And so I, I just wonder, where is this curiosity? Doesn't he want to know? Is he just so sure that it can't be true? Well, this is where the atomic bomb was actually developed. It used to be a series of barracks right around this pond, and that's where the actual work was done to make the first atomic bombs. In 1939, Einstein signed a letter to President Roosevelt that a new kind of bomb was possible. Fearing Nazis would make the bomb first, the president ordered the creation of the U.S. Atomic Program. That eventually led to the establishment of the Los Alamos National Lab in 1942. As part of the Manhattan Project, the codename of this effort by the Allies to make the first atomic weapon. Some of the best minds in the world were summoned to Los Alamos. The International Collective included 14 Nobel Prize winners. Legends like Hans Bethe, Niels Bohr, Albert Einstein, Enrico Fermi, Richard Feynman, Glenn Seaborg, and others. The work of the lab led to Trinity, the first atomic test near Alamo Gordo, New Mexico, and Fat Man and Little Boy, the bombs that were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Today, the lab is still America's top nuclear lab, conducting secret research into national security matters, space, renewable energy, supercomputing, nanotechnology, you name it. It's a pantheon to top modern science. Los Alamos County, the lab's home, is one of the top five richest counties in the U.S. Los Alamos is also home to the most educated and healthiest population in America. Well, you know, I came here for two reasons, to talk to the scientists and for the trail system. After talking to the scientist for a while, that's a lot like hitting your head against the wall. It only feels good when you stop. So after I've talked to the scientist, I have the mountains and the trails to go on to, to regain my sanity. Looks like it was designed by a bunch of scientists, that's for sure. Try following the roads around here for a little bit, see if you can make sense of them. Whoops, that's as far as we can go. Here's the Omega Bridge. And here would have been my camp. Right in here somewhere. But if you follow that road on down, what you see is it goes into the side of the mountain. There's another place that it goes in. All under here, under the town, is a gigantic cavern. And that's where the first nuclear reactor was assembled here. And the first one that was working in Los Alamos. And I guess for Cold War purposes, it was all put underneath there. There is a gigantic chamber underneath Los Alamos. The rumors are, and they're probably they're true, is that there's tunnels that used to go all under the city. I guess to get around in the war so nobody on the surface could ever see what was going on. I used to use this trail all the time at night time. I was always afraid to use a flashlight that somebody might see me, so I would walk it in the dark, sometimes in the completely dark. No moon at all. When I got here, it was right in the spring and it was kind of a nice spring. So I thought, well, I'll just um, camp out for a few days and look for a job and everything and move into the city. I thought that probably I would get a, 
apartment at some point, I'd find a job. But as the summer went on, that things never worked out. I just kept staying there, and then it got closer and closer to winter, and I had to do something. I still hadn't found a job that I thought was appropriate that I could do and still do my work. So that's when I been, began building the first cave. I just didn't want anything that would take me away from my philosophy and my chances to talk to people about philosophy. So I didn't want to get like a construction job where I was just at a construction site all day doing that and because there, there just would be no opportunity. So you need time to think complex thoughts. I like walking in the forest because this is my office and my home. This is where I have a chance to be myself or I have a chance to think long and thoughts and not be interrupted. Or I have a chance to share the energy with the trees and the other beings. It's just so peaceful and so quiet. And so much of modern human life is just hectic and driving and having to be here or there or do this or that. And it's just so important, I think, to be at peace, to be have quiet, to listen, and to be with nature. Nature is just another word for God to me, so this is how I be with God. I actually had two. I had one that burned down. I call, didn't call it a cave. I called it a rock lean-to. And I spent two winters in there and then and then part of one and the other one. I don't sleep much at night and um, usually awake a number of hours through the night. And so um, being out there alone, I like to listen to the radio and have something to keep me company. So I had a lot of trouble keeping batteries up on radios and that kind of stuff, and then that's when I decided to, I did a number of experiments with little solar cells and then really realized that I needed to build a bigger solar system that stored more energy and then use it to recharge all my other batteries and do that. So that's when I began buying a panel at a time. I brought them down, bought all the batteries, carried it all down in the middle of the night. I think what I needed most was not to have to work and earn a living all the time. That's what's so hard to do because it distracts you from my real work, which is being a philosopher, which never ends. I wake up in the morning thinking about the different things I'm thinking about. They, it's always in my mind, night or day, and I never stop actually working. So the time I'm walking in the forest is when I feel like I'm in my office and I'm doing the most I can to help humanity then. When I walk in the forest, every connection, every leaf is a part of God. And every leaf has a story to tell, part of God's story, if you just take the time to understand it. I took paint and dulled all the windows so they didn't shine, and I had camouflage and netting, and I painted the rocks too, and it was all built in. You could, you could really couldn't see it from 10 foot away. Another thing I was working on, I was hoping to get a satellite dish at one point so I, I, could, so I could actually do internet from my cave. but. And they caught me before I got all that accomplished. We would talk with Mike, especially as we get to be winter time and so forth. About where do you live, Mike? Do you, you know? Do you need uh, some kind of comfort? He was always very um, mysterious. He fit right in with Los Alamos. He was always very mysterious about where he was living. We had our suspicions, uh, but none of us ever like tried to follow him home or anything like that. In the snow, it was really hard for me to hide my footprints. I knew this guy walked every morning to the lab first thing about 8 o'clock in the morning. So the days when it was snow and I had to hide my footprints, I would walk backwards into the trail, or the steps that he'd make, make a couple of circles around there and confuse the whole thing. We wanted to make sure that he was comfortable and he assured us that he was. Um, then one day it turned out that he was a little too comfortable <laughs> and the smoke from his fire was noticed and, and uh, people discovered that he'd been living in a cave and uh, literally and um, of course that had to stop. Well it did say DOE on the one edge of those properties <laughs> but you know I took the vertical area most humans want the horizontal place on top I, I didn't think they was really using the vertical spot so I took the spot the Indians would use. A friend of mine gave me a wood-burning stove. I'd already made up my mind I was only going to burn it at night so nobody would see it. This particular day that I got caught, it was snowing early in the morning and it was cold and I just wanted a fire so I started one. just thought it'd be so nice if I could just be like a regular person and just sit home and put my feet up beside the fire and be warm all day and not have to get out and hike in the snow all day to build up my energy. And everything worked fine except that 
about five o'clock, all of a sudden the snow parted, the clouds parted, <laughs> and my smoke, which had been hidden all day, was now visible. And since I was only about 15 or 20 foot from the DOE, someone actually noticed the smoke and called the fire department. My first notice of it was I heard engines running. And I was used to the sounds of the canyon, and so I knew when people stopped or started or when they drove by. And I heard a guy across the canyon say, there's somebody looking out a door. And since all the firemen smoked marijuana, they recognized the plants that were growing. And so they called the police. <laughs> <laughs> I was sad and relieved too because it's, you know, a pain not knowing what's going to happen and knowing that people don't approve of what you're doing even though I thought it was ecologically sound. Forced out of his cave and shunned by scientists, Micro Mike did not find Los Alamos to be welcoming. It was not the scientific utopia that one could envision in the home of the Manhattan Project, a premier example of what could happen when the best people are united in a common goal sharing ideas, making advancements that would otherwise take years to achieve. The famed scientists who came to Los Alamos in the 1940s worked hard and played hard when they had a day off. It's strange to realize that the end result of the years these brilliant men and women spent living in New Mexico was the production of the world's deadliest weapon. Humans have the capability of doing immense good or immense bad. We can easily blow this planet up if we want. So I don't think we're an advanced form of life. I don't think we're civilized until every person on the planet Earth has enough to eat. Every person on planet Earth can get an education. Every person on Earth can communicate with whoever he wants to, move to wherever he wants to be. Maybe then we could call ourselves civilized. Right now, I don't think the rest of the cosmos wants us. Because we're a warring species, we like war, and we want to take the war with us. During his years in the cave, Micro Mike attempted to reconcile his ideas about human nature and science in a new theory he called gravionics. I've often wondered, did I think of gravionics, or did God put it in my mind, or did the aliens put it there, or, you know, where did the thoughts come from? Are we capable of thinking new thoughts? Um, I don't know. All I'm, I'm thankful that they came and then we have them to work with. In some ways it's a very complex thing to figure out and in some ways it's just so simple that once I have a chance to tell everybody, so many people will just say, oh yeah, it was so easy, why didn't I see that? It's just a matter of the way we look at things. We build models in our mind and in societies as we grow and those models have not been accurate enough to represent the real world yet. So it's a process of humanity coming to full awareness as a species we started from nothing and we've risen up and become aware of ourselves but we're not finished yet i think we have to become aware of the gravitational system before we're truly considered aware gravionics is the um, study of the energy of all real physical systems and in particular the connections of gravity which are called gravions which arise from the mass and actually are a part of the mass so gravionics is a study of the mass the gravions they generate, and the energies that transfer through those gravions. The first time I came up with the idea of the gravion, it was like the first time I heard of sex. 
I thought it couldn't be that way. <laughs> I was in elementary school and a friend I was walking to school with explained to me what went on and I thought, well, that, that just doesn't seem reasonable. It can't be that way. In sex and, or gravity? In both. And then when I got the first idea of the gravity on, I thought, it just can't be that way. That, But then, turns out that's the way it is. <laughs> Two things cannot know about each other if they haven't in some way touched. And these invisible gravion connections is how things touch and exchange the information. All information in the cosmos must go through those. The gravions are, I think, are like hollow tubes when they're connected and, and you can see the wavelengths moving through them. And so all energy must move through these connections, otherwise how can it get somewhere? All of it requires those connections of gravity for any information, and I think it works the same with people too, for us to exchange information. There must be connections of gravity, whether they're through the air as we're talking and moving the molecules, or whether it's mind to mind as we feel each other's emotions and needs and wants. One of the best examples I can think of is when Jesus was walking through this crowd and this woman reached through the crowd and touched his robe, and Jesus stopped and he said, a power has gone from me. Energy has moved between my system and another system. Who did it? And the woman told him it was her, and they had their conversation and everything. But you see how there was a, a flow of energy there through the gravitational system. So I just think Jesus was very, very aware of it. He was able to manipulate the gravitational system. That's the way he healed the people and did all kinds of what we would consider miracles. I think he just better understood gravionics than I do and was better able to practice it. I think that gravionics can bridge the, the gap between science and spirituality. Two rocks meeting in the middle of the night can't be good or bad. If they run into each other and blow it up, it's not good or bad from any viewpoint. It's just something that happens. It's only actions of a sentient being that can be good or bad. And so therefore human beings can actually control the exchanges of energy that occur between us by being aware of it and by changing our actions to do spiritual things. If your friend is sick and needs energy, then you should give him your energy. You should also spend the time like out in the forest or whatever it takes so that your energy is strong enough for you to have extra energy to give to others. And then the most important rule of all, I think, is that you should never take energy from somebody else without their knowledge and their awareness. This is the prime thing that's happening wrong in our world. Everywhere we have people that are over the other person, they take their energy and lots of times they're not even aware of it. But the person who has his energy taken usually is aware because they feel bad because it pushes them down, it makes them feel less, it makes them feel less connected, less valuable. And so if you want to be spiritual to other people, then give of your energy, make connections of gravity with them and don't break those connections. So there's a trail that I have to cut through the canyon. I walk every day. In the winter, there's another friend, a neighbor of ours that's 70 that runs 120 miles at a go. Um, goes through there too, but he has running shoes. So he just kind of shimmy down the trail and you just leave it ice. So I built this, I built a, nice a switchback switch so it's not steep, so he can get up and down in the winter. <laughs> Jim was doing all this work and some other lab guy had come back and just criticized everything he was doing. You're putting the rocks wrong there, you're the switchback. No, no, what it was? He came down, it was definitely a lab guy, and um, he, he decided to have authority over me, so he decided to tell me how to do it. He, just, he assumed the responsibility that he's one up and he can tell me how to do it. And, you know, I was just doing it as a volunteer, so I didn't accept that. He but. was rising over you, and he was putting down what you're doing more or less, and he was drawing energy from you yeah. for his own benefit. Yeah. When I came and saw what you was doing, I was just praising God that here was somebody here fixing the trail. And so I thanked him over and over several times. Micro Mike has approached a number of scientists over the years, hoping they would study his meteorite and talk about his theories. His attempts at getting the attention of the scientific community have generally been ignored. He doesn't have the right kind of education and background to get anyone to pay attention. Is it likely that the passionate ideas of a man who spent years in a cave have no merit within the scientific context? Or has science become a closed institution, a club, that is no longer open to outsiders? Can science still claim to be searching for all truth? I can tell you better what's not science when I reach it than I can sometimes about what's good science. In science, you have to test your ideas against the physical universe. Science is basically a collection of rules and procedures for the purpose of evaluating what you find out about reality or what you think you know about reality. One of the wonderful things about science is that you can ask questions. You can ask questions about any kind of question. It doesn't have, you can be crazy about it, but you have a responsibility to test it. That's one of the appeals to me is that it's 
not a popularity contest. If you have an idea that's different than other people, you can prove that you're right. And it's not just like trying to sort of influence people. There's actually a correct and incorrect answer. I like to think that, that science is the ability to discover how to use that with which God has gifted us for the betterment of humankind. There's a fundamental interest in scientists just to discover new things. And there's a beauty in that. I mean, it really is, a, for me, there really is a beauty in this uncovering new laws, new, new behavior, uh, new, new states of matter. Here it is, General Groves, plutonium. Well, that's the uh, first I've ever seen. But uh, after this, if you don't mind, I wish you'd uh, hold something under it. Because after all, there's about over $50 million in that too. There's always been a disconnect between what science is doing, what people truly understand about reality, and what the average person knows. Back in the early days of science, there was a huge disconnect. The less was known then, and the fewer people were scientists, and the people who were not scientists had absolutely no idea what was going on. To a large extent, that's true even today. Most ordinary people have only the most rudimentary understanding of what's known in science. What I believe science is, is like the study of the world and things that are mathematical and just, just about everything that revolves around the world. I look to science to explain things in a, like a way that makes sense and a way that's logical and uh, not, not so much like creative, not imaginative, it's more hard facts. Science is the study, the study. of everything around you. Science made these. Probably. Made my makeup. Mm -hmm. Electronics. <laughs> Wait. Um, yeah. Science? Um, I think science has done a lot for me and everybody in general. Because, you know, every single day that we wake up, we breathe in, you know, oxygen and carbon dioxide for the plants and everything. So it's helped me live and helps everybody else live. There we go. You look for some pattern in, in life and you come up with some theory and you gather some evidence. And if the the evidence is consistent with the theory, you keep it, otherwise you alter the theory until the theory um, really explains everything that's out there. A scientist really should have a logical mind. A scientist must also try to get past his own emotional attitudes towards things, look at life and reality in an objective way, independent of one's emotional feelings about it. Uh, not all scientists do that, unfortunately. So, but the better scientists do. If you have some sort of revolutionary idea and you want to change the way people think and sort of um, impose some sort of philosophy, some general philosophy, um, especially one that has something to do with people um, and, you know, um, maybe concepts such as good, bad, you know, love, hate, things like that. Um, you could try uh, fitting that into science, but, you know, science works on the, the principles that your ideas have to be testable. I think the most important thing in science is we never have to accept anything on faith. And everything I've done, I believe, is real, can be proven real, can be measured, even love. We don't have to accept love on faith. It is real. Gravionics is the first model of science that's big enough for love and actually has a definition for love within the model. Love is the actions of a sentient being whereby they give more energy than they take and they make more connections of gravity than they break, realizing that every connection of gravity, every human event is a, a relationship of gravitational connections and exchanges of energy. So when you give your word to somebody, you're making gravitational connections with that person both within your mind and their mind and between you that you're going to keep your word. If you keep your word, you uphold the order of the cosmos. If you break your word, you're tearing down those connections that exist between you and you're destroying part of the order of the cosmos. So love is not served in that manner. I would love to discuss my work with your group. My goal is to change the image of Los Alamos from the home of the bomb to the home of gravionics, the first scientific model to include love, your friend, Mike, Mike Cron. <laughs> uh, so I called him up. He, he is easily written off, and he makes people angry. 
especially scientists. There's a gal across the street from him who's a scientist for the lab and won't even talk to him. He, 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 he asserted that here's the real equation that is the, the foundation wonderful equation and she wouldn't give him the time of day. I mean, good God, what are you talking about? Equation E is equal mc square, in which energy is part equal to mass multiplied with the square of the velocity of light, showed that very small amount of mass may be converted into a very large amount of energy. Einstein said that E equals mc squared, and everybody that's in science apparently believes that without ever even considering the implications of it. I say that it doesn't take into account the gravitational component. It cannot be right. I say the correct equation is E equals gmc cubed. If I'm not right, then prove me wrong. Mike used to think the equation was E equals gmc squared. How did you say that, say that the other day with the, by adding g into the, say that again? Not Einstein was the... Um... Well, there's several different ways I've said it, but G can also stand for God, so it's like adding God into the equation or the spirituality. So. E equals MC squared stands for... For the atomic bomb, e equals GMC squared stands for life and love and all those things that are... Is that, is that what I said the other day? You Pretty much, something yeah. Something like that. The way you said it was just real clear last time. Yeah, I know. I should have wrote that down. <laughs> I got along great with him as long as I wasn't referring to his book. When I began reading his book, and and it was such a, I, it was so badly written, and organized, and and the assertions he would make, with no reference point. So he would assert certain things about the scientific community and claims, with no backup. You can't do that and be and be and be taken seriously. In this, in, the, in this world, if, he's exper if he expects this community to give him a time of day, he's got to speak their language. And if he can't, if he can't learn it, then get out of the game. This is Fuller Lodge. This was part of the ranch school that was here at Los Alamos before the atomic bomb was born. So whenever the, they decided to use this to make the bomb, they kicked everybody out. So there's a lot of history here. Probably everybody associated with the bomb has been in this building at one time or another. I've looked through the records and it appears that Einstein came to Los Alamos twice. So I suspect he walked through here too. It's special to me since he's my hero. We held graviotics meetings here. Unfortunately, there's not a very large gravionics population yet, so <laughs> the room was way too big. Many people that go into science are self-motivated. They're not doing it because they're emulating Einstein or anybody else. They tend not to be people who follow the crowd. They're, they're not the people who, um, the groupies, you know, you don't find Einstein groupies, certainly not among scientists. If anything, they'll try to find all kinds of reasons why Einstein was wrong. I would give anything if I could have five minutes with Einstein to explain what he did, where his thinking was wrong, where he made his mistakes. He would love me so much to show him because he wanted to understand. I think he really cared about the truth and really looked for the truth. And I think, you know, as opposed to most of the scientists today who don't want to listen to me, if someone wrote him and said, look, you know, look at gravity in this way, see if that doesn't fix your problems. I think he would have been really happy to look at it. Einstein came up with um, special relativity working in a patent office, not being paid as a scientist. So, you know, he had read a lot and studied a lot of the science, but he was, one of the reasons probably he was able to do what he did was that he was uninfluenced by money. He didn't have to write a grant and convince someone. It appears to me that most scientists are far more interested in just keeping their income than they are actually ever understanding anything new about the world. When I was in college in the 70s, I thought I'd figured out the problems that Einstein had, and I thought I'd figured out a new model, but there wasn't any proof. So I just set in my mind, if there was ever any proof that came up, then I would revisit the situation. One of the things that I thought was it couldn't possibly be a single Big Bang, that there had to be more than one. 
and so I never ever accepted that that model. So what I was what I'd said in my mind was if there ever any evidence of more than one Big Bang, then maybe it's time to start looking again at what you did in college. The Big Bank or Bang? bang? The Big Bang. Oh God. Where kind our of Earth theory? came from? Um, like when the Earth was created. No, I think the world was created by God. An atom just exploding and everything, everything else, you know, just forming. So. It looks like, at least from the secondary knowledge that I have, that we've really settled on the best model that we've got is there was a beginning, and, and that beginning was a Big Bang. The Big Bang to me is the idea that everything started compressed in like one little, like immeasurable tiny spot and exploded massively basically collapsed upon itself because that one little spot was so heavy and so dense that it just couldn't sustain itself, I guess, and exploded and started this whole process of expanding elements that started to form together because of gravitational pulls and create planets and suns and, I mean, not the sun, stars and etc. This is the article in Discover Magazine, Crisis in the Cosmos. This is what got me upset. One of the crises is that the cosmos was younger than the age of a lot of stars. A lot of stars were thought to be 20 billion years old. So if you say, well, the whole cosmos is only 15 billion years old, that's a crisis in the cosmos. But it wasn't for me because I never thought there was a single Big Bang. I thought, well, if that star is older than the last Big Bang, that just meant it was made in some other Big Bang somewhere else in space and time. From that point on, I just became almost totally obsessed with thinking about it. I started giving up my material life. I call it dematerializing myself. When you own things, they tend to own you. And I left the house, I left my car, I left all my possessions, I left everything, basically. I kept my camping stuff and <laughs> a few things like that. Just couldn't work at a job anymore. It just seemed so um, unimportant compared to thinking about gravity. I quit my job where I was working, taking care of the 100 computers. It seemed so evident very quickly that my work was right and that I must devote my life to it. It meant that I've really found out who my friends are and most of them have abandoned me. There's just a few that is willing to spend the time, stick with it, and accept me in my new altered state. <laughs> you know, to be honest, most people just can't imagine not being, not loving things. Most of our society, we're just so into the cars and all the things that we want, they just can't recognize anybody that's not into that. And so I was just so different to them that they couldn't, they couldn't, the only way they could interpret it is that I was crazy, you know. And if you, I guess if you say that you've discovered a unified model of gravitational systems, you're either crazy or you're a genius, one of the two. In 1996, Micro Mike left his life in Amarillo, Texas and headed on foot towards New Mexico. At least here in the convenience store, I can talk to people about cosmology and these kind of issues. Mm, it looks like a lawnmower parked down there. There's a mattress. You know, that's one of the things. Los Alamos is a place where people have pretty much what they need, so there's almost no crime here. This is how the kids get in trouble, is come throw an old bicycle over the edge of the canyon. Just think if the whole world was that way, where everybody had enough, maybe there wouldn't be a need to have wars and to fight each other. Well, yeah, it's a very unusual town. You don't find a strong spiritual component, but from an intellectual, logical point of view, they are male-dominated, I might add. It's not, not a very feminine city. You, you meet some of the most amazing people you'd ever want to see anywhere in the world. Many times on the trail, I can be sitting there, and people have walked within three foot of me and not seen me and I can be sitting just like I am right here. Somebody will walk right by there and not even know I'm there. And I guess I forget to turn my invisible off sometimes. In pre-gravionic science, the eye is considered a passive device. It's just sitting here and the light comes in and strikes it. But that didn't seem to be the whole thing to me. When the eye opens and when the eye powers up, that I think what happens is we send out a series of connections of gravions from the eye that attach to everything that we see. And then from those connections of gravity, the energy of the sun bouncing off each thing, travels through the gravions into our eye. One thing I kept noticing is that 
as I would say drive down the street, sometimes it's pretty hard for me not to look at a pretty girl that's walking. And so I would notice that I would look at her and then she would turn and look at me. And I wondered how she knew that I was looking at her. But when I realized that the eye is an active unit, an active gravitational device, that it puts out a series of connections of gravity that attach, then it made sense. Because as I looked at her, I was attaching gravions with her. She felt the energies flowing through the system and she turned around to look at me. When two people's eyes meet and they've never seen each other before, they call it chemistry, but I call it gravity. They have gravitationally connected and energies have been exchanged right in that second. They know a lot about each other already just because of the exchange of energy, so that's gravitational. You must always remember that your mind is making a model of the reality that exists outside of it. Light is coming from outside the world, it's bounced off these things, hitting your, your eyeballs, and then it's transferred into chemical and electrical messages that transfer to the back of your brain, and then right back here, it creates an image of what's out there. Now, we're so well designed, it looks like that we're actually seeing what's out there, but we're not. We're actually seeing the model that's made in our mind, and so it's always once removed from the reality itself. Okay, move out. It was always interesting when you'd go get a haircut and you'd have a Vietnamese barber and he'd take out a straight razor to shave you and you'd always wonder that first <laughs> cut, is he on our side or is he on the other side? In those days, you either volunteered or you were drafted, though it wasn't like it was a... <laughs> Why'd you volunteer? Well, probably the main reason is I wanted to get away from home, and my dad was still making every decision in my life. I couldn't make a single decision, so I made the decision to join the Marine Corps, and then I couldn't make another decision for four years. <laughs> so I showed him. I was in the Marine Corps band, and there was a few times that Apparently people were shooting at the band as we was playing or something, as we was out in the middle of something. But I never did have to shoot anybody and I never did see anybody get shot, although three of my friends were killed in the band the month after I left Vietnam. Survival is a very strong instinct. And if it's me or him, I probably would have had to do something. But on the other hand, I've never been in a fight in my life. The main jobs of the band was to um, play for the military, like play colors, which is the raising and lowering of the flag and, and all ceremonies and things we played. But the other half of what the band did was public relations. We played for orphans and orphanages and schools and even cities that was having some kind of special thing. We'd go into a little ville and play and say, we're going to win your heart and mine or we're going to kill you. <laughs> After I got out of the Marine Corps, I went and worked on my great aunt's ranch near Canadian, Texas. My aunt always picked me to do the fast jobs. I was so fit a lot of those times that I didn't get a horse. I had to just run in the field and pretend I was a horse. <laughs> and I used to take a lot of pride that I could keep up with the horses in the field, to cut the cattle, and to keep running the entire time. We were feeding cattle that winter. I think it was the winter of 7071. On this particular day, we entered what was called the North Meadow. We were driving and we turned north after about a quarter of a mile and the instant we turned north, my aunt and I both saw this rock. To our eyes, it just stuck out like a sore thumb. She exclaimed when she saw it, she says, what's that on my ranch? And I said, well, it looks like a rock. If it fell from space, that means it's a meteorite. My aunt drove over near to it and I got out and, and just looked at it. I got to it about I'd say 20 foot of it and I just stopped and kind of looked the situation over. I knew it was an important moment because I prayed for a meteorite. When I'd come to a tough time in my life and things was hard, lots of times I would get it out and set it on the floor and just look at it and say, well, God does answer prayers, miracles still happen. Have faith and get through this tough time and maybe things will be better later. I've defined a miracle as just when the infinite possibilities overcome the finite probabilities. When the infinite possibilities overcome the finite probabilities. When the scientists look at my meteorite, they say it's improbable that this would happen. And it's so improbable they think that it can happen. But nature doesn't deal in probabilities, I think she deals in possibilities. 
And so even though it's highly improbable that all these things would come together to bring a meteorite with life to me, a little child that prayed for these things, apparently the infinite possibilities did overcome the finite probabilities. And this is a miracle in my book, and it's here sitting here. Somewhere 50 million years ago, some lava flowed on Mars, apparently at the base of one of the ancient Martian volcanoes as it was dying. And then it lay there for 36 million years on the surface and nothing happened. And then 13 million years ago, the same vent apparently became active again and lava flowed again. There appear to be air insects, land insects, and water creatures all in the same meteorite. So the sample is almost impossibly good of what was living at one time at the base of that volcano. Another part of the miracle was a large asteroid had to impact Mars at some point and eject this from the surface without harming it. Um, seems to be a miracle there and then it would make escape velocity and, and leave the planet Mars and get into space seems to be a miracle and that it would eventually be captured by the Earth seems to be a miracle and that it would make it through the atmosphere with as little damage as it has seems to be a miracle and that it have a shape that's like a lifting body that NASA tested in the early days seems to be a miracle that it actually had some lift if it was just flying through the atmosphere it didn't just fall like a rock and then the fact to me that it landed within a mile of where I was sleeping and within maybe 15 miles of where I was born as someone who had prayed for a meteorite all my life if God had got any closer, it would have hit me in the head. It's one of the most basic questions of all of humanity. Are we alone or not? I think the meteorite can clearly answer the question of are we alone and say that we're not. Someone once asked me what the most important thing I could find in it. And I says, well, if we could find a little pop top off of a aluminum beer can from Mars, then we'd certainly know there's intelligent life on Mars but I'm not, <laughs> I haven't found that yet, so. <laughs> so I can't prove there's intelligent life on Mars, but I'm not sure that I'd want to try to prove there's intelligent life on Earth yet either. So. About 15 years after I found it, I noticed that there was a, a fuzz was sticking out right there out of this crack. And I just thought that awful strange. Why would that be happening? And I just noticed over a period of years that it seemed to stick out further and further each time that I would look at it. Later I found out it appears to be a life form that made it in the meteorite and is still alive today. It was actually growing out and pushing itself out from the inside of the meteorite out. called them the glassy Martian rock fungus because it appears to live off the rock itself. When I first found the meteorite and you couldn't find any of those on it. Now you can go on almost any vesicle. We could pick any hole on here and look at it under the microscope and you would see those things growing in the bottom of the hole now or coming out or they're, they're covering it now. They're everywhere. So they're definitely increasing and growing. Turns out there's a disease called Morgellons disease that may be the first extraterrestrial disease. Morgellons patients started contacting them that the filaments that was coming out of their sores and out of their out of the disease, when they took pictures of it, appeared to look just exactly like the pictures of the filaments that was in my meteorite. When I first started getting sick, I had a mole on my leg that fibers came out of, and I went and had a, a dermatologist looked at it and he burned it off, it came back. He didn't know what it was. Um, soon after, I started having brain fog. It gets into your brain and you can't think straight. Um, causes depression, uh, severe anxiety attacks and stress. And soon after that, I started gaining a lot of weight. For a long time, it's just been considered some kind of psychosis or something that people don't actually have a disease or just think they have one. There's no pharmaceutical drug to treat us. Doctors are doctors of medicine. I was getting bites on my all over my body, especially at night, and I noticed black specks coming out of my skin, like the size of a pepper, and glitter coming out of my skin. It almost looked like a tiny wing of a bug. Thank God I had a young daughter I had to take care of, because she's what kept me here. Otherwise, I think I might have committed suicide. 
it was that severe. I have at least 20 or 30 friends I talk to on the phone regularly who have this, just saying, yeah. hang in there. Well, There's I got ousted there. from the Morgellons community because I kept saying it came from Mars, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, they I pretty well eliminated me. <laughs> well, I've said but, I think it comes from outer space. But, but I, well, I think it's the first extraterrestrial disease. I really do. Mm -hmm. I've identified it now on four or five Martian meteorites. My friends around the world have looked at different meteorites. It's on more than mine. I suspect they've probably been coming to Earth from Mars for most of the planet's history. To get here on a meteorite and live, they'd have to live in space for probably at least a few thousand years at near absolute zero. But that condition's not unlike what they'd have on Mars, on the surface of Mars. So if they learned to adapt there, then they probably could make the trip to Earth. And it appears to me that they are making it and living through the trip and, and multiplying once they get here. I don't know if we have been so successfully brainwashed that anybody who speaks the word alien or extraterrestrial is automatically assumed insane. All the stories about UFOs and aliens are centered around the, the atomic plans of the United States. That's why they're in New Mexico and Roswell and all those places, because we were doing weird things there. And so if they are visiting our planet, I'm sure they would want to know what's going on at Los Alamos. We may threaten the rest of the galaxy with our desire to kill each other. But after I moved here, I was having trouble sleeping one night, I guess I always did. And it was about midnight and I was laying outside and um, I'd just seen a shooting star, so I was paying a lot of attention to the sky and I heard the roar of a jet engine. And just as I looked up, a shiny silver object came out from behind the tree and about 50 foot behind it, it was a jet airplane chasing it. And they both went, I'd say two or 300 foot over the lab, I guess going as fast as that jet could go. And I don't know why we would be sending shiny objects over the lab in the middle of the night. <laughs> it looked like something reconnaissance in the lab to me. I've heard that they, they actually have an EBE, or an extraterrestrial biological entity over there at the lab. Almost everything here came from the lab at some point. Alpha, beta, gamma. See the yellow on there is uranium. <laughs> I suspect we must be undergoing some kind of cosmic test. Right now, I think we're making a failing grade. very discouraging. I mean, this rock is here. You've seen it. I, I didn't make it up. There's no way I can fake all those little creatures and stuff inside of it. Those are all things that are there. Somebody ought to be studying that. And humanity ought to be allowed to know what it means. Micro Mike had written to numerous scientists and universities, trying to get them to study his meteorite, all with little response. Undeterred, he had labs perform tests on the rock that, according to him, prove its origins. Here's the red rock. 49 million years, plus or minus 1.3 million years. Mike also wrote to luminaries like Stephen Hawking, conveying his gravionics theories. Uh, you see, I work for days and days writing him a letter. Mr. Moore penciled in, Professor S.W. Hawking appreciates your writing to him as he is always pleased to receive letters. However, he very much regrets that due to the severe limitations he works under, he does not have enough time to write you a personal reply. So we don't have time to read your crap. Either the scientific community is very, very incompetent or there is some kind of conspiracy going on. Neither option sounds very attractive to me, but it's the only two I can think of. I had so much frustration among the whole scientific and meteoritic community of getting them to study this meteorite, and I thought it so important that I wrote letters to my congressmen in, in Texas and my senators. In 1998, Mike wrote letters to his Texas congressman, Mac Thornberry, and Senators Phil Graham and Kay Bailey Hutchison, asking that they forward his request to study the rock to NASA. By a lot of persistent effort, I got them to require Congress and the Oversight Committee to do a congressional investigation of the meteorite. His persistence paid off, and he got a meeting with a leading meteorite expert. I think everything in that crack is 
from Mars. And I have confidence in my ability to observe things. I mean, five to seven years ago, I noticed in these cracks, these things growing out of it. And then when I put water on it, that came out, and that's one of the 49 million year old rocks. And I know that for sure. Calcium and iron is a typical one to determine Martian territory. It's one of the biggest problems is I just can't get anybody to talk to me about in this. So I... We discussed what needed to be tested and where, and we agreed upon it all, and I thought he was going to test it. And then he ended up writing what I consider a totally false report to Congress. He looked at none of my ages or any of the evidence that I accumulated whatsoever. And then he wrote a false report to Congress claiming it was not a meteorite. And then I wrote a reply to it. Every single paragraph I showed where what he said was wrong and was untruthful. But at that point, when I told my congressmen and senators that he had lied about the whole thing, they assumed that I was the idiot at that point and they stopped even answering my letters. I'll tell you what, if he'd have looked at this, my son would still be alive today. My son, of course, died at 19, and it was tragic because he was my biggest supporter. He used to sit on the meteorite. And he knew Dad and trusted me. He knew I wouldn't lie about something, and so he always believed it was a meteorite, and he always supported me. So it was really a blow for that reason and others when he died. It made it really tough. My dad believes it's a Martian meteorite. That's what we're here. It's because the geologist, and we got a bunch of tests done on it, and it was just real strong evidence. I was there when he was born. I was the first one to hold him, and I'd learned about the connections that occur. And so I had gravitationally connected with him at birth, and we were really close and connected. As long as we're alive, if we connect with somebody, we can maintain those connections. I think wherever they go in our part of the cosmos, my son always said he saw lights, and I never believed him as a parent. I thought it was, you know, the monsters under the bed or something. And a couple of nights before he died, this light came into my tent that I'd never seen before, and it was just totally amazing. It stayed for a few seconds, long enough for me to sit up and look at it, and then it just left. And the only thing I could think was I've been visited by an angel, and, and it's here to comfort me because something's going to happen. The night that Aaron died, it was announced that it was a suicide. And that night, in Molly's dream, Aaron came to her three times. One of the times he told her that it wasn't suicide, that it was an accident. The first thing he said was, it's an accident, it was an accident, it was an accident. And the next day, the coroner announced it was an accident rather than a suicide. And then the other thing is, Aaron asked Molly what he should do. And, you know, he asked me for advice, you know, as he always did, and I told him, um, just to go up and, you know, he's free now and, and don't be stuck here because I've seen spirits that are stuck here and it's not pretty. The third part of that vision, I saw him step back across the room and, you know, my brother, he had a, a really bad drug problem which had caused him, though he was 19, he looked like he was about 40 and his face, you know, was just wrinkled with anxiety and, um, and grief and in this vision his face changed it was the same same person but he changed back into like an infant soul like a, a beautiful 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 person or spirit and it's like his face was young again and he was the same height it was just truly incredible it was a gentle spirit in a tough world he just had a tough time he needed to solidity of a family together and everything was division in his life and everything was turmoil. He just never had a, a proper chance to make it. I don't know how someone can see all this beauty and not believe in God. Of course, I guess it depends on what your definition of God is. I just 
can't imagine that Christ meant for there to be so many variations, all of them calling themselves the Church of Christ in some way. In Los Alamos, we have 33 churches, some very tiny, some very large, and there yet is only about 40% of the population that uh, claims to identify with the church. One of the reasons I moved to Los Alamos is it is this giant contradiction of all these scientists and, all these, and then all these churches. If you look the fundamental Christians, they say everything came from nothing 6,000 years ago. <laughs> and, the, and the cosmologists say everything came from nothing 13.7 billion years ago. The only difference I see in the two models is a lot of zeros. <laughs> I think a lot of those zeros are scientists too. I've defined God as a progression towards order. And if he was already here ordering things, that's okay. And if we come along and perceived him, then he becomes real in our perceptions. So however we want to look at it, he becomes real one way or the other. Although, to be honest, it doesn't require anybody to believe in God. If God is defined as progression towards order, then a good place to find God, according to Micro Mike, is inside a black hole. <laughs> well, that would be where all the order is for any particular universe. <laughs> He's centered in that black hole. I had spent ages trying to think of what it was like in a black hole and what was going on. And I've seen uh, cosmologists that say they haven't a clue of what it would be like in a black hole. I spent hundreds of hours of my life there, I feel like. That's a very interesting question though. I mean, does anybody ever, does anybody really know? I like a never ending, like, a never-ending universe, never-ending, I don't know. I, I learned this and I can't remember. Space. Yeah, it's in space. It yeah, in space. space. A big hole um, in space. Something that sucks you into it in space. I don't know, something about it, massive, uh, where the gravitational pull is just so incredible that light can't escape it, um, and so black. A never-ending space well. That's true. There we go. Yeah. Am I afraid of it? I guess. If I was in space and I was an astronaut. A black hole is basically something like an area that is so dense. It's the same thing, kind of like the Big Bang, but not quite. It's like basically a star that was so massive and it actually like imploded on itself. And then that area was so dense that, because basically I guess the idea is that you have such a small amount of space that's so dense that it actually has like an intense gravitational pull. It starts like, Having, I, I think some scientists actually say it's like a rift in space and time or something. Science has moved well beyond any ordinary person's understanding what's going on, even at the basic fundamental level. Everybody in this country is starting to accept that our scientific education is inferior. I mean, even where I work, it's like, whenever we're like, oh, we need a really smart person, let's get someone from another country. <laughs> and I think that's the, the problem is this education. I think it's part of this age when the amount of information, the amount of discoveries, the amount of uh, data are overwhelming and, and some cause for angst. Physics, even experimental physics, is so broad now that very few people can get their arms around the whole field. And that's easily demonstrated by just looking at um, standard physics journal. The weekly breadth in that uh, journal is numbing. Um, I can scarcely read, nor could I spend the time to read uh, more than about 10%. scientist has to specialize in a smaller and smaller area. You can't just specialize in plants or you can't just specialize in junipers. You have to specialize in the flower of a particular juniper that blooms on the north side of a, <laughs> of a mountain. And so we need somebody and science is looking at an overview and we just there's there's no place for it in our society right now. There's nobody looking at the overview. You know, I compare it to the elephant. We have a whole bunch of people that's one says no it looks like a trunk, one says it looks like a tail one as it looks like legs and stuff, but when I wanted to shine a gravionic flashlight on it and say, no, here's the whole elephant, look at the whole darn thing. Don't just look at one part of it and claim you're seeing everything. I 
I miss the the beauty of my old location, the sounds of all the animals and all the ones that used to come visit me, the eagles that would land in the tree right outside my camp. It was a beautiful place. I felt like the whole thing was mine. Nobody was bothering me or giving me a hard time about it. And I was doing my own, I was making my own money, I was providing my own energy and I was living off the grid without consuming basically any carbon. So I think my house was a model for the community. <laughs> um, well, that part of the Micro Mike story was, I have to admit, a little bit inspiring, you know, that he was able to, uh, to find a way to uh, sort of live off the land and do so in an unobtrusive way, obviously, since he wasn't discovered for so long. Um, I personally don't think I could handle it, uh, and unless I were really driven to extremes, I wouldn't try. You might want to go to a monastery and sit instead of living in a cave. Yeah, well, you can't imagine living in a cave to give you any benefits because you're so distracted by just simply having to be comfortable, being warm, having food. I mean, that's a terrible distraction from whatever uh, spiritual understanding that you're trying to achieve. Yeah, I think I'd live in a cave um... I don't know, hypothetically though, I mean, not at this point in my life, you know? No, I, I've, I've thought of living in a cave, of, you know, leaving society and becoming a hermit, but for reasons completely independent of my desire to uh, succeed in science or philosophy. I find it unlikely that one's scientific or philosophical or any kind of intellectual accomplishments would be greatly advanced by cutting off all connection with people. The way I look at it, there's plenty of enough people in the world that's thinking about money and sex, and so I don't need to think about either. Somebody needs to think about philosophy. After he was forced out of his cave, Micro Mike camped out in a forest. When he was kicked out of that location, he lived for a while in an apartment complex known as the Caves, until eventually ending up in this house. I have three solar panels, but when it snows, I can't reach up there to clean them. So I took one of them, moved it down there where I can reach it, and then I modified an extension cord to run the current from that one to here. So then when it snows, I can go down there and wipe the snow off of that one, and I have at least one panel that's, that's generating current. At Halloween, when I answered the door, I had the lights off. <laughs> <laughs> hands at the door like this. It looks like two big red eyes on there. NASA was going to been planning for several years to go to Mars and bring back a sample, and they're planning several billion dollars to bring back maybe one pound. I've got 22 pounds of prime Martian real estate, apparently beachfront property. <laughs> so, you know how beachfront property is. I'm sure I'm part Martian by now because I've breathed the dust of that, and I'm sure I've eaten it in and in my food and everything else. So I have particles in my body that were made on Mars. <laughs> I think all things are possible and I'm not qualified to make any kind of comment about whether that really is a rock that could be from Mars or not. Uh, but it's intriguing and, and I think certainly it's worthy of uh, verification if there's a way to do that and that it certainly would be worthy of, of verifying and putting that to rest if we can. Uh, some things we, we can't. The Shroud of Turin for one has been studied here. Uh, from all sorts of uh, carbon dating and other ways to determine its authenticity. And it's still not 
easily and totally verified as to whether it is authentic or, or authentic in a different way. And um, so science, um, while it, it, it's a great approach, doesn't always come up with the answers either. What I'd like to do is to license it to some university to study. And what they would do is put it in a, in a case under total 24-hour-7 view of the internet and so that everything that ever happens to it, every test that's run, if they break it open and some little insect falls out, would be done live on the internet and that the whole world could watch it while that was happening. But in exchange for the ability to study the meteorite, what the university I want to provide me is to begin a process of unifying the knowledge of the world. I want them to provide every class that needs to be taught from kindergarten through college level, that they provide it on their website, that they provide multiple people teaching everything multiple ways, and that they provide it free to everyone, and so that any school then could, just with a small pad computer, could have access basically to all the knowledge of the world. Some people wonder, well, is, is Mike for real, or, or what is this about? But if you spend a little time with Mike, you understand he's very much for real. I really believe I was born just to change the world, so that's what I'm here to do. I'm, I don't care about getting credit for it or anything. I just want to get it done. So, whatever works. It's just hard to change the world because people like to keep going the way they've been going. <laughs> Have you noticed that? Definitely. You know, I don't see very many other people out there who are trying to change the world for the better. It'd be fun, it'd be a nice ride, but I don't think it's going to happen. I think it's just going to, you know. Um, I mean, there's, there's nifty things that you can work on, at least. I, I made the switch from theory to experimental physics just because I, I found sitting at a desk all day extremely boring. Um, at least I get to work with my hands now, and, and I'm content with that, you know. Uh, I find it interesting, and the driving force, I mean, I probably use the word nifty now a few times, but that's kind of sort of like my driving force. Hey, it's cool, it's nifty, it worked, you know, it's, that's a neat result. Uh, we actually went out and did it, and, and it, was, it was neat, it wasn't noisy, it didn't have big error bars, for example. For all my life, I felt like a little boy in the back of the room asking questions. I hold up my hand and say, look, I've got an answer, and then nobody will ever call on me. Is it possible for someone to develop an area of thought that really is a true advance? Uh, it's certainly possible. It's so rare that I can't think of a recent example. I think this is the first new philosophy in a long time and I'd be honored if someday I could be considered among some of the people who have changed human thought for the better. Gravionics is all about the presence. It's about the connections of gravity that exist right now and the mass that exists right now. We can have connections of gravity with people that are on, totally on the other side of the planet, which boggles my mind that connections of gravity could extend that long and define that much space, but the evidence is overwhelming that that's true. And then human beings have the capability of making these connections, but not breaking them even though we move far apart from each other. If we love each other and if we continue to put energy in those connections, those connections of gravity can extend at least the distance of the world, and maybe even a lot further. I don't like to play alone. My whole life I've never ever wanted to do a solo because to me that's not what music is about. Music is about people working together and playing together. You cannot play a symphony orchestra by yourself. It requires a group of humans all under the same instruction, all caring about each other and all working as a group. And in the end, if you wanted to know the essence of gravionic spirituality, that's it. Play music together. When you do anything together, you're solving problems as a whole. And if the human species would just learn to work together, there's no problem that we couldn't solve. So I hate it when someone asks me to play alone. And the only reason I'm willing to play is because I've never practiced and I've never had a lesson in my life. And so this is for all the young kids. If you want to be good at music, practice and take some lessons. <laughs>
if I could have my way in the world, I would like to be the philosopher of Lanel. I would like to be able to go over there and work with the people and improve the morale. I think the productivity of the lab would just go up immensely if they would learn gravionics and let me help them. The philosopher is supposed to have long hair, a beard, and wear sandals, the best I can tell. So. So you're a conformist. Yes. Yeah, so. <laughs> that would be identifiable as a philosopher. All right. <laughs> you know, I'd like to see the day where we care as much about scientists and philosophers as we do about football players. Can you imagine 100,000 people going to one location and all cheering somebody that's thought of a new idea? <laughs> Wouldn't that be better than just some big bruiser that's able to knock his way through all the guys and run? The end zone. <laughs> An infinite cosmos I once did seek. Into the vastness I tried to peek. I looked as far as I could see and found a special star for me. I want to travel to the star, which looks from here to be so far. So how does someone make this trip without the benefit of train or ship? The mind's eye is a place to go when trips abroad are way too slow. I go there often and visit long to keep me healthy and make me strong. Now if an infinite cosmos you would see, then close your eyes and come with me. Take all the time that you would spend as an infinite cosmos never ends.